Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of What You Gonna Cue. We want to welcome back our viewers who may have been at the Sundance Film Festival. While you were gone, nothing changed, but we are jealous that you left to begin with. As always, What You Gonna Cue is a weekly video series in which we highlight some of the best titles that Netflix has to offer, with recommendations broken down into three categories. Instant Karma, where we recommend some of the best instant titles to watch before they expire. What the f*** is this? where we highlight some of the obscure or overlooked titles buried in the annals of Netflix, and For Your Consideration, where the recommended titles tie into a timely, predetermined cinematic theme. And also, as always, I am one of your co-hosts, Jim Rowan. And I am your other co-host, Alex Rabinowitz. Alex, I was thinking the other day, and it seems like we've been on a bit of a documentary kick here in recent weeks on What You're Gonna Cue. We have? Yeah, well, last week we recommended two documentaries, uh, okay. and this week, uh, I think speaking of documentary kick, I would like to kick off section one with another documentary recommendation. And the documentary that I'm going to be recommending this week is Dear Zachary, A Letter to a Son About His Father. When director Kurt Kenny heard that his best friend Andrew Bagby had been murdered and that the prime suspect was pregnant with Andrew's child, he decided to memorialize the dearly departed so that his son would at least know growing up who his father was and how many lives he had touched. What starts as a loving tribute to a son, father, and friend soon turns into a document of an emotional and legal roller coaster that threatens to permanently separate Andrew's parents from their grandchild. Why did Andrew get killed? This movie sounds familiar. I think I've heard of this once before. You may have heard about it if you read our 2010 year-end roundup blog, which if you haven't, you should do so right now, in which I mentioned Dear Zachary is probably the best thing that I watched on Netflix all of last year. Now, a lot of documentaries, the uh, documentarian tends to maybe exploit some of the subjects in order to manipulate the audience into getting an emotional response. Do you think that's the case here? Admittedly, Kenny did have a subjective standpoint when he was making Dear Zachary, but I think that to a large degree it's completely justified. But also, I don't think that the emotion and the reaction that we have to it is manufactured by any means, which emotionally manipulative stories often do. Mm. I think that the emotion that we derive from this film, which range from the highest peaks to the lowest valleys, uh, are just as close as possible to a cathartic experience that we can have with the audience without having experienced the tragedy that they have gone through themselves. Held a press conference and announced she's four months pregnant with Andrew's baby. This seems like some really heavy material. Mm -hmm. How does Kenny make it so it's not just the most depressing thing you've ever seen? Yeah. Admittedly, Dear Zachary is just emotionally draining. After you've watched this film, you think, I've just spent an entire year's worth of emotion in an hour and a half. <laughs> uh, but there is hope at the end of it as well, because while I don't want to give anything away, Andrew Bagby's parents have spearheaded a lot of changes in the legal system that was hindering them. Uh, and it's just, Dear Zachary is a great testament to just the human spear, as cliches as it sound, because of just how Andrew Bagby's parents persevered through just tragedy. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, when does it expire? It expires February 24th. Uh, I learned my lesson from Heat, so you have plenty of time to watch it. Um, and February 24th is also the day that my 26th year on Earth expires. That's right, it's my birthday. So for nothing else, watch Dear Zachary because it's my birthday present. Mm. Jim, I have a birthday present for you. Do you want to know what it is? I do. It's a movie in section two. All right. Mumblecore goes Hollywood with the Duplass Brothers studio debut, Cyrus. John C. Riley plays John, a divorced loser who falls in love with Molly, a similarly damaged woman as played by Marissa Tomei. The only complication in their newfound romance is Molly's overgrown son Cyrus, played by Jonah Hill, who is bent on sabotaging his mother's new relationship. Oh, whoa, whoa. Sorry for interrupting you. Mumblecore and Hollywood mainstream filmmaking are two distinct tastes that really don't seem to play well together, like let's say a peanut butter and blue cheese dressing sandwich. Ugh. So, making that transition from low-budget mumblecore to a little bit bigger-budget uh, Hollywood mainstream filmmaking, how is that handled by the Duplass brothers? Is the tra transition smooth? They are stepping up to the plate here with a low-budget studio picture, mm -hmm. and it is different from their mumblecore films in the past, where they were really just a small crew, digital cameras, all handheld, improvised scripts, just letting the actors kind of go with it, with the story. Mm -hmm. And here, they're a little bit more reined in, but they don't lose themselves, and they still produce a film that is true to them and true to their style. And Studio Cash certainly seems to attract, you know, more studio-friendly actors. Uh, like you said, John C. Riley, Marissa Tomei, Jonah Hill are definitely A-listers. 
What are you doing? The light is seeing your hair in this great way. It's like a crippled tree reaching for heaven. Um, and you know, I like John C. Riley. I like Jonah Hill. I've seen Step Brothers. I've seen Superbad. They're really hilarious films. But Cyrus, you know, definitely isn't the kind of slapstick, really raunchy type of comedies like those have been. Um, they seem to be, you know, pulling it back a little bit more in this. Yeah, they are pulled back. It's uh, the movie is more of a dramedy. But that's not to say that they aren't funny. These guys really bring their wacky selves to this more subdued film. And they do provide the uh, comedic tones that this story needs. And it's interesting how John C. Riley and Jonah Hill are almost two sides of the same coin. Like maybe Jonah Hill could grow into John C. Riley one day, you get the feel. And if you have those guys bringing the comedy, you really, the Duplass brothers really rein it in and invest the right amount of sentimentality and heart into the picture that creates this dramedy that is both touching, funny, sad, frustrating. And that doesn't rely on special effects and blood and gore and musical numbers or anything flashy like that. But if you are curious about those kind of titles, then maybe you should stick around for four-year consideration. These days, there seems to be no more of a polarizing trend in cinema than that of the remake. Uh, be it Hollywood classics, underappreciated B-movies, or foreign art house films, there seems to be no genre or style of filmmaking safe from the remake treatment, which, according to science, is the number one cause of adultery, famine, and my luck with women. And bad breath. Yeah, those blue cheese and uh, peanut butter sandwiches may not be helping that either. No, well, that's what I had for lunch, so just deal with it. All right, fine. Occasionally, a film like Let Me In, which comes out today on Blu-ray and DVD, comes along and is worthy to be mentioned in the same good breath with its original. So in honor of Matt Reeves' critically underseen and really truly exceptional remake of Swedish vampire flick Let the Right One In, we have decided to dedicate for your consideration to some of our favorite remakes. Yay! And speaking of horror remakes, I'm going to recommend The Thing. A group of American scientists working in the Antarctic think that they've rescued a seemingly innocent dog from a seemingly psychotic group of Norwegians. It's only until their own dogs start being killed and their own crew members start acting strangely that they realize what they've let inside. John Carpenter directs and Kurt Russell stars in this atmospheric, paranoid thriller where the ever-changing threat means that everyone is a suspect. If it takes us over, then it has no more enemies. Nobody left to kill it. And then it's one. Jim. Yes. I didn't know this was a remake. Yes, and you learned something today. The Thing is a remake of a 1951 sci-fi film, The Thing from Another World, produced and essentially ghost-directed by legendary Hollywood director Howard Hawks, but what allows The Thing remake to succeed is that screenwriter Bill Lancaster took the basic original premise, um, but added his own kind of twist and originality to it, uh, most specifically just this idea of, you know, who's who, who's the threat, and just this, you know, constant tension that just keeps building and building and building until the end. Now, John Carpenter isn't Howard Hawks, but you really have to hand it to him with how great this movie is. Yeah, I'm sure I won't be blowing anybody's mind by saying that John Carpenter is not the most beloved director out there. Uh, he certainly made seemingly as many bad movies as he had good movies, but even people that don't like John Carpenter really have to give credit to The Thing. As I said, it's just got a really great atmosphere. John Carpenter gets really great performances by his actors, specifically from Kurt Russell and Keith David and uh, Wilford Brimley. I'm a diabetic. But... This movie was made in the 80s, and they didn't have the modern advantages of CGI. Ah, yes, the modern benefits of CGI. Yes, uh, the one thing that the thing is really known and loved for is the fact that they use entirely practical, physical special effects, uh, as created by legendary Rob Botton. And also, uh, doing some uncredited work on the thing was uh, Stan Winston, who himself would go on to be a legend in the, the special effects world. So anytime on screen that you see arm sprouting out of a head or a neck protruding from a body or a chest cavity splitting open, that's all actually happening right there in front of the actors. And it's so great because almost three decades later it still holds up. It doesn't ever come off cheesy like, you know, a low budget B movie would. Uh, but also the intangible factor I think that practical effects add is that the actors are actually reacting to something. Mm -hmm. They're not standing in front of a green screen and pretending that they're seeing something. There is actually blood spouting out of them and a chest cavity is ripping open right in front of them. And I think that adds a little bit of subtlety and nuance and just, you know, believability to their performances. But are there any musical numbers in the thing? It, no. Well, I'm going to do something about that. All right. It's all glitz and guns in Rob Marshall's Best Picture winning musical, Chicago, based on the Broadway show by Kander, Ebb, and Bob Fosse. The film stars Richard Gere, Renee Zellweger, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Queen Latifah, and yes again, John C. Riley. 
1920 Chicago, washed up talent Velma Kelly and wannabe star Roxy Hart find themselves on death row together after both are accused of murder. But it's the fight for fame that could keep them from the gallows. All my life I wanted to have my own act. That's great. I'll be in touch. You know, I'm not quite finished yet. Jim, who said the musical is dead? Uh, I think I did once, but I may or may not have been drunk, and I may or may not have cried afterward. All right. Well, you and anyone else is dead wrong. Because this winning Best Picture, firing on all the cylinders that it does, performance, direction, music, all of it, everything, just goes to show that the movie musical can still succeed today like the way it did financially and critically back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Mm -hmm. Well, Alex, uh, haters be hating. They so do. they might say to you, uh, you're cheating a little bit here on our theme with remakes because isn't Chicago actually just a, an adaptation, a big screen adaptation of a musical? It is, mm -hmm. but it's also that's also a remake of something and a remake of a remake of a remake. Oh. You see, let me give you a little background. Okay. In the 20s, there was a real life Roxy Hart okay. that actually committed a crime such as this. Mm -hmm of which some guys created a play, a Broadway play, in 1927. Okay. From there, there was a movie based on that play. Oh. Then, in 1975, Kander, Ebb, and Bob Fosse came along, and they based their stage musical off of the original play. Okay. Have I lost you yet? No, I'm still with you. All right. And then, in 1996, mm -hmm. uh, there is a revival of that musical, of which Rob Marshall creates his 2002 movie, and he also draws in inspiration from the 1927 film. Haters still be hating. They always hate. Uh, because what they're gonna say is that just a couple years later, Rob Marshall directed another musical called Nine, which critically and financially tanked. Uh, so what elevates Chicago above that? What separates these two? Why is Chicago so great? I think where Chicago succeeded and Nine failed is in its weave of fantasy and reality. With the mu movie musicals, people usually find it hard to believe that someone's just going to break into song. So sometimes the films will have to come up with a construct to create a reason why they're singing. Okay. The story of Chicago involves these women who want to be cabaret singer stars. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's very easy to imagine these characters performing, even though what they're going through is jail, murder, trials, horrible, very cold, realistic things. It's an interesting juxtaposition, and he does it very well in Chicago because it works for Chicago. That's Chicago. Ah, uh, yes, that pesky reality always bursting our fantasy bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, in our fantasy, what you're going to cue is infinite in just the perpetual video show. Uh, in reality, we have to end the show right now. Sad, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, once again, guys, we want to thank you for watching. And if you get lonely or you need some company, you can always email us. You can visit our Twitter page. You can visit our Facebook page. Or you can visit our website, whatchagonnaq.com. Uh, until next time, guys, always remember that I drink your milkshake. I drink it up.